you and thanks to the Native Learning Center. This is the first time we've been here and it's really just, not only is it a fantastic facility, but it's so impressive, the efficiency which, the efficiency with which they run this event. It's just, uh, it's like the best training, um, best run training I think I've ever been at. So we really <coughs> appreciate that. So I'm Brian Pearson. Uh, I head up our Indian Nations law team at Godfrey and Khan. My partner, John Clancy, heads up our environmental and renewable energy team. And because of the importance of those two issues, John and I work really closely together. Um, we did have a PowerPoint like Lynn's. Ours was a, a little late. I think it's available here. I didn't get into the materials. Uh, Godfrey and Khan, I, I love the way the Native Learning Center spelled it. They have Godfrey and Khan, K-H-A-N. I've always been, been urging our firm to convert to that spelling. It, just, <laughs> it gives us the opportunity to, to urge people to, to you know, make an accommodation with Mr. Godfrey because if they don't, they're going to have to face the wrath of Khan. <laughs> so we've got it here. Godfrey and Khan, I love that spelling. Um, we do have uh, an Indian Nations Law legal update that we do every month. If anybody wants to, if they're interested in getting it, it's free. Just give me your card and we'll send it. On that note, uh, there was one case in the U.S. Supreme Court this term that was decided this morning. The case of Lewis and Clark, I won't go into it. We have limited time here. But it was a sovereign immunity case and it went against the tribe uh, on that. It had to do with whether or not somebody acting within the scope of his or her employment who was sued personally, no relief was sought against the tribe. Money damages were sought against the tribal employee, whether or not that person would be protected by tribal sovereign immunity. The Supreme Court said no. So we will, of course, be covering that case in our newsletter, hot off the press. It's just happened today. The only Supreme Court Indian law case this term. Um, we're going to be talking about how you can convert to clean, renewable energy that's much cheaper that will drive down your monthly operating costs. And it's also a leveraging type of uh, program as well, like Lynn's and some of the other programs. So you'll find, it, you'll see that it's a little bit complicated. Uh, we have made it work in the real world with some very uh, high achieving tribal housing authorities, some of which are here today, and we're very grateful to them. Uh, and you will see that although it's not simple, it's very, it's very valuable. It's a presentation that we usually do at NAIFC for 90 minutes. We have 45 minutes. Uh, so with that, I won't take any more time. Most of the expertise, when, I, when we do these projects together, I address the federal Indian law issues and the tribal law issues but the vast majority of the expertise lies with John in the energy area. So with that, take it away. Great, uh, thank you, Brian. Um, again, as, I, as Brian mentioned, I'm John Clancy. I head up Godfrey & Khan's environmental energy practice and work closely with Brian because fortunately we don't work a lot with Indian tribes and tribal housing authorities on a number of both environmental protection initiatives, protecting the reservations from impacts like mines and other things like that, and then working with tribal housing authorities and tribes on on solar and other clean energy projects that can help hopefully meet their both their uh, environmental goals and economic goals and especially I think for housing the ability to really address um, what to me I've learned is a real key issue uh, that you know tribal housing authorities can help keep housing costs down through lower rents through subsidized rents you can't really control what the utility charges so this is really a, a, an effort to try to address really in my mind the second half of rents because Oftentimes, with subsidized rents, the cost of electricity and other fuel can be as much or more than the rent itself. So that's kind of the focus of this. Um, and I'll talk a little bit, as Kevin mentioned, about the job opportunities, too. I think they're very important to know about, too. So just kind of quickly, this is a little bit of a blurb about Brian and me and our firm. Um, I'm going to move on, but it's, uh, Brian has a lot of experience in any law. I have a fair amount of experience in environmental energy law. Um, and kind of, you know, why should you care about this stuff? You know, I think what one key issue that's been talked about a lot, um, especially at the beginning of the, of, the, uh, of the conference, is how the block grant money really has not gone up. Uh, and because of that, it really is going down because of inflation and costs. And so the question is, how do you bring your operating costs down, both for your own housing authority and then also for your members? And that's what this is going to focus on, on that, that idea there. 
uh, you know, energy expenses have become a high cost to both housing authorities, both tribes, and then their members. Um, and one thing, that, I don't know if your tribes or uh, housing authorities do this or not, but there's, there are, you know, federal funds to help pay for uh, energy bills sometimes, and then sometimes tribes supplement that. But especially if the tribe is paying for it or the housing authority is paying for it, um, even if it's helping the tribal member out, it's obviously a tribal expense. So the key thing is how to address that. Um, and then, uh, you know, really the question, how do you leverage your block grant money to get more stuff done? And that's what this is going to really focus on. So, um, you know, what we're going to talk about is how to be, how to really leverage effectively and, and aggressively to both finance the renewable energy projects. And we're going to really focus on solar because solar, one, it's come down tremendously in price. Um, actually, one thing I would have a reason about this before we could mention at your work. We've been fortunate to work with Aquasas and the Housing Authority on, on actually two large solar projects, basically. One for the members and one for the Housing Authority's own properties. Um, and one thing we saw was that we applied for the grants um, about a year and a half ago. Since then, the price of solar has basically come down from about $3 per kilowatt, or from $3 per watt to about to under $2 per watt. So it's come down um, about a third in the year and a half time frame. So it's becoming much and much more cost effective and then if we can use these financing tools, we can make it more effective yet. And then again, reducing your tenants' monthly energy costs. Again, the idea that you can, you can control the rents, you can't control the utility charges, so here's how you control the utility charges. And then obviously also being consistent with tribal environmental values, uh, going from typically, especially in the Midwest, coal-fired power to clean power or in other locations, sometimes you know other fossil fuel power to clean power. So that's that. We normally have slides that go through the climate change issue and what's kind of brought this on, but instead we'll just have a shortened version, which is that. Uh, so in the first part, we'll talk about the this kind of some basics of energy terminology and what solar is about. So we can kind of be on the same page there, hopefully. Uh, first thing is you probably have heard, especially the term kilowatt hours. Since on everybody's energy bill, it always charges you per kilowatt hour. So it's something we, we all deal with. Uh, but there's two kind of basic concepts for energy. There's uh, things called you know, watts, kilowatts, or megawatts. If it doesn't have the hour after it, that's really the capacity. That's the, typically for a solar facility, that's the maximum amount of power it can produce at any time. So for solar, it's always the maximum amount is, you know, on June 21st, the longest day of the year, in the middle of the day, that's what it'll produce. Um, and then you have consumption or, or, or production. You know, what is actually the energy that's actually produced? That's where you get to the kilowatt hours that you see on your bill. And so you'll have a, you know, typically a, a one kilowatt system or system that's, you know, one kilowatt in size will produce somewhere between 1,200 and 1,400 kilowatt hours per year for the folks that are in the room or the locations we are. Maybe a little bit, maybe in Southern Florida or maybe closer to 1,500 because it's, further south and it's relatively sunny. But I guess one point there is that solar, it works everywhere. It does, it, you produce more if you're in the southwest than if you're in where I'm from, Madison, Wisconsin, but you still produce in the general range of 1,200 or 1,100 to 1,600 kilowatt hours per kilowatt, so it, it can work anywhere, essentially. In fact, the country with the most solar is Germany, which has really bad solar conditions. Um, and so then, you know, if you're, the basic idea of, you know, you know, if you have a kill, if you're going from kilowatts to kilowatt hours, the way I think about it usually is for a, for a light bulb. If you have a 100 watt light bulb, or hopefully now if you have more efficient light bulbs, it's less. But if you run it for 10 hours, uh, then you'd be at, um, you know, a kilowatt hour uh, of, of usage, because it'd be 100 uh, watts times 10 hours to 1,000 watt, watt hours, which is one kilowatt hour. So this is a map just showing the solar production. You can actually work kind of this area here. You can see it doesn't really, it's not like it, there's tremendous variation throughout the country, but you can see obviously that if you were in the Southwest, you'd be the best, best area for solar. And uh, so when we're looking at, you know, especially for solar, we, we worked with the uh, Mole Lake tribe, uh, Chicago and Chippewa community in, in Northern Wisconsin. And through the HUD ICBG program, as well as through a DUE grant, uh, they were put solar on both all their tribal buildings, but then especially uh, about 60 homes as well. 
And uh, so when you think about how big is a solar system, they put them on the roofs of their homes. They varied in size because you want to make the right size for the right house, including, you know, if it's on the roof, what will fit there? Because if you want to use the space that faces south, you can. Um, and you just want it right size. So and you, you also want to make sure you're not overproducing because you don't want to give the energy back to the utility at a cheap price. Um, but eight kilowatt hour, eight, I'm sorry, eight kilowatts is a pretty standard size for a lot of like, yeah, like a three bedroom house. And uh, actually the prices continue to come down, we might be below that now, but it's, um, you know, costs are probably around $20,000 per house to put it on. Uh, that's before all the incentives that we'll talk about. And then, you know, as you probably have seen, it looks like that. And uh, because, you know, I just wanted to point out is that wind is also becoming much more cost effective. You typically you want to be in a more windy area. There's also, I think, going to be a lot of advances in that technology in the, in the near term. So I think it's good to follow that, especially for your tribe as a whole. If you're in all of the windy area, there's going to become more and more opportunities in that. And both of these have, importantly, have the availability of these tax credits. These are the two technologies that get it, so I think it's important to be aware of that. And you'll have to switch what typical wind, windmill looks like now, but there are other designs that are being developed right now, so you'll see changes occur on that. And then, uh, so one key thing about both solar and wind is that they only produce energy when, you know, solar when the sun's out and wind when the wind's blowing. So the question becomes, you know, how do you handle that issue? And fortunately, um, if you go to the next slide, most utilities have what's called net metering, which allows you to receive billing credit at the full retail rate typically for all the energy produced from a solar facility, let's say, if it's solar. Um, uh, at the full, you get the full retail rate as long as you don't overproduce typically the, the amount that you're, you need for the home for the year is the typical way. It varies utility from utility, but so what it allows you to do is put solar in based on the overall energy consumption of the home rather than trying to make sure it matches up. Uh, and it allows you to begin, the key thing is getting the full retail credit so you can lower the bill by the full retail amount. One other concept just put up there, and this is what actually Rita's working on a lot in her team here, that her whole team is here, which is great, or a lot of her team is here, uh, on net zero homes. That's just the idea of you know, actually not using any more energy in the facility than what's produced by the renewable sources that serve the facility. So uh, if it's solar on a home and you have electric heat and you have a heat pump, you can actually size things so that all the energy is basically produced by the solar system and you have a home that doesn't need any energy from the grid. So the next break is here, and then now just keep things moving on. I'm going to go through kind of the overview of what we've been working on with you know folks like Akwesasne uh, and others, pretty much Bull Lake and, and other tribes and housing authorities to uh, implement solar in as cost-effective way as possible. So kind of going through that. Um, what we try to do is, is start to think about, kind of reverse the thinking that it's, uh, you usually think about your energy bill as a negative, which it, which it is. Your, any bill you receive, you've got to pay as a negative financially. But it allows, you know, because of the ability for solar to produce energy and produce value because of it, it offsets. Uh, it's an offset, it, it provides value back to either the homeowner or the tribe or the tribal housing authority. And we use that as a means to help finance the system. Uh, we also try to take advantage of both federal opportunities and state or utility opportunities that are available. One thing that's important to note on the slide in this is that at least most states have, on top of federal opportunities available for grants and incentives, state opportunities. So we try to take advantage of both. And then we take advantage of the tax credits, which is, this is not very dissimilar to what if you did a loan housing tax credit project, what you do, you think about what are my funding sources, what are the tax credit value, what's the tax credit value, and how do we package it together? Um, Actually, one aside, because Kevin asked, so I don't forget about this, you know, job opportunities and training. Um, what we also do on these projects is, well, two things. One, there's an entity called Grid, Al Grid Alternatives, which is great. It's a nonprofit that helps to install solar and can provide great training for members to actually get trained on how to install it, install it, and then be ready for other jobs, basically. The reason why I mention other jobs is because solar is actually, um, it's one of the fastest growing industries in the country and in the world right now. It's because of what I touched before, that the prices keep like coming down and down, and now it's really at a very cost-effective level where you can, even without a lot of these incentives, make it work well for, for locations. And then, so one in every um, 50 new jobs 
in America is now in solar, especially solar installation. So it's tremendous, it's grown tremendously fast. It, there's a lot of opportunities. So like for instance, with Atlas Osney, if the members there are trained on the project and can install the project, they're then poised to work on other projects. And one thing else to know is that, you know, it's kind of a combination of good um, basic construction skills and then particular industry skills. So if they decide they don't want to do solar, they can do something else. But there's so many uh, installations going on now, especially in areas like New York where they have good incentives, California, but also anywhere uh, that it's a great thing to be trained in because of the ability to get a job. And there's nothing Donald Trump can do that's going to change those economics. <laughs> no, this is true. Yeah, it gets into you know, the whole thing of oil, you know, oil, it's not so, yeah, supporting coal. Uh, the thing is that this is a technology, it's like, to me, it's like flat screen TVs where. You know, as they produce more and more, the price comes down, and so it's a great, great thing to be involved in. So this is just a slide that goes through, and Brian put this together uh, from the, I think it's called the Energy Information uh, uh, Agency. It has the price of energy for residential electricity in various states. A lot of the states that are, you know, folks are in. Now. I got all the states uh, of the uh, of the use that tribes are reflected on these two slides. Yeah, and there's others that we might want to visit sometimes, like Hawaii, uh, <laughs> things like that. But as you can see, the price actually varies a lot uh, per kilowatt hour. Um, but also, the usage also varies. So in states where, a lot of states where the price is lower, people use more, both because of conservation, you know, can, you need more conservation if you're paying more, in, more for your energy. And also you might be in a, an area where you just get more air conditioning needs or you use more electricity more for your heating. Um, another thing is that this price, these prices are, are not necessarily your prices because this is a statewide average. So if you're depending on the utility territory you're in, you pay a different rate. Um, but I think it's just helpful to see that it varies, and this is what we're really taking advantage of because we can we can offset these amounts of money. With these, the these are the numbers we want to bring down. The red ones. Yeah. So this really shows, I think, probably on an average basis, at least the kind of this might be what you experience. You know, your members are probably paying somewhere between a hundred and two hundred dollars a month on electricity. And if we can address that effectively, we're, we're getting that kind of reduction in their overall rental costs. So it's more of the same. Is that about well, seconds you can look at your rates if you want for a second? Um, and then I'll kind of go on. So now the question becomes, you know, how do we finance all this stuff? And so as I mentioned before, a key thing is, is grants, and we some of the grants are the same ones are the same agencies, at least in, in organizations we've been talking about before. Uh, and then, uh, taking advantage of the investment tax credits, and there's actually, it's, two, it's a two parts, actually. It's, there's an investment tax credit, and people don't talk about it a lot, but it also applies for home housing tax credits. There's also depreciation benefits that the investor gets, and it's important that you know about that so you can take advantage of that, too. And they actually have a lot more value here because this is equipment. The equipment has a much shorter depreciation schedule, which means it's much more valuable to the investor. So those are two aspects of the tax aspects. And then, um, and there's also then, as I mentioned before, oftentimes state and local incentives. And I'll give a website that is helpful to look at for your state to see what might be available there. And this item, John, is what you were talking about on the earlier slide about taking advantage of consumption as an asset, turning it into an asset. Exactly. So um, one thing we'll talk about is that we're, we're kind of combining, just like in low income housing tax credits, uh, two things. We're, we're taking advantage of, of grants and incentives, which I think folks in the are you know, aware of a lot of different types of those. And then, um, but also uh, taking advantage of the, the tax credits. And, and to do that, there's two things going on here. One is that uh, we need to show to the IRS, just like the loan housing tax credit project is run as essentially a business, that we have some income coming in uh, that um, uh, shows that, and we have a tax investor involved so that we can uh, get the tax value, tax credit value, depreciation value to the investor. The way that typically is done is through, and it can be called different things, but it's something like, the, the, the most general name of it is the, the power purchase agreement. And it's just to allow for that uh, affiliate of the tribe or tribal housing authority to provide energy to either members or the tribe or the tribal housing authority. And, um, and we'll, we'll go into more detail about that. Uh, there's also, um, as I mentioned before, net metering is very important, so we want to make sure we can have a good net metering agreement with the utility so we get full retail credit for the production of the energy. And then, uh, Brian, you want to speak about that at all? This is a bear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
you'll want to employ a bear in your projects at some point. Um, and then actually one more thing about jobs, just to kind of emphasize as I was mentioning, is that even if you don't use an any like grid alternatives, which is a nonprofit, you know, kind of trainer of folks and, and, and can install the projects, uh, it's very important that in the contracts that we do in all the contracts that the provider, the uh, you know, the solar provider provides training to a especially a specified number, so it makes sure it happens, of tribal members to be trained in and to do the installation and then also get trained in operation and maintenance. There's not much work in operation and maintenance of facilities like these because they don't have any moving parts, but it still has to be done and it also is, is good training for your child members to have so they can have employment in both those areas, installation and operation and maintenance. Does that help with section three also? Yes. Okay. It can, yes, it's a good way of, I think, addressing section three is making sure that you're bringing in the low income mm -hmm. members that basically works. and getting employment out of it, exactly. <laughs> So here's, you know, some of the some of the grants that uh, are, are kind of key to this to solar. I think uh, are available for solar can be key for solar. Uh, one is the DOE Tribal Energy Grant, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, as well as the, um, you know, the block grant money can actually be used for this too, but we usually try to avoid block grant money and instead go for other grants. But then the, as we put a fair amount of talk was uh, a fair amount of discussion was. Uh, occurred today regarding the Indian Community Hub, uh, Development Block Grant that's actually out there right now. That can be used on projects and we've worked with tribes to successfully obtain that grant and then, and then use the tax credits with that. There's also, um, uh, especially for larger um, projects, if you were, especially like if I was talking to a Southwest tribe, I'd probably say we should probably also get a DOI planning grant uh, for solar because you can get those for energy projects and especially if you have a strong um, energy resource to go after and you can get to $250,000 so you can plan out, you know, for one of the larger southwestern tribes, but actually even any larger tribe, you know, a tribe like, um, well, any tribe with a fair amount of population, you could you could plan out solar for your whole community as part of that, and that can then be used, I think, to negotiate for a lower install cost, too, with the provider, because you have your whole plan laid out, you have all the energy information together, you have all the um, drawings together for the solar project. You're ready to go. You're ready to go to contract then on the whole amount. Um, there's also I'll talk a little bit the U.S. The DA REAP or Rural Energy for America program, which is an, also an important grant program that our, our clients have gotten. Um, and then it, I think it varies. It, I deferred to the folks back there that spoke book, book earlier, but uh, there's a federal home loan bank affordable you know, housing program, which was talked about this morning. We've actually been in communication with the Des Moines Bank about potentially sold that for solar and they said that was fine as long as you had your basic housing in good shape so your, your house is house were in good shape but I think that varies from district to district and so I think it's important to talk to folks about that and there's others too but so those are the basic federal federal uh, grants that we've worked with uh, on projects now I'll go into a little bit more detail about those uh, in the next slides basically especially the key ones um, so we're going to focus I'll talk about the ICBG uh, the DOE and the Rural Energy for America program, uh, as well as the fact there are obviously NAHASDA guaranteed loans, which could be used on a, on a larger scale set of projects. There's also USDA guaranteed loans. So there's, there's various uh, ways of getting more money into the projects. And then especially I'll talk about the tax credits too. So um, I think you're all aware of, you know, what the purpose of ICDBG is, you know, to, um, uh, basically promote the development of viable Indian and Alaska uh, Native communities, including decent housing, suitable living environment, and economic opportunities. Um, but then it obviously principally focuses on folks that are LMI, that are low to moderate income uh, folks. And so we need to make sure our projects focus on those. So um, there's a variety of eligible uses for, for ICDBG funds. The key thing I want to point out is that the regulations specifically call out solar as being applicable, especially for housing rehab. So the projects we've worked on so far have been housing rehab projects, so existing housing units where solar provides energy sources to those facilities. And really what it does is it provides the equivalent of putting in very efficient equipment uh, to lower the energy usage of the home. But it basically you know, lowers the energy costs and profile of the home. Uh, you can also use it, you know, for public facilities and improvements and private utilities. So these two, you know, it is possible, I think, but we haven't done it yet. We've 
I want to talk to HUD more directly, folks in the room perhaps about this, you know, providing, if you're going to put solar uh, that would service other buildings like community facilities, potentially to do that as well. Uh, what we found though with our tribal housing clients, what they tend to be focused on is, you know, how do we get, how do we reduce the energy costs of our members? So therefore the, the focus is all been on homes or residences. And this just goes through, which I think you've all seen, seen the NOFA, you're aware of it, uh, the amounts of money that are available in the different regions. And what we, we're, I guess we're all, we're all here, so it's 600,000, which actually was discussed this morning, should that go up or not, but uh, that's the amount available for the projects. And then, I think as you're all aware, that grant is due soon. I think it's May 18th, so soon. Um, and the awards are expected in September. Uh, so, and I'll get into more about the tax credit stuff later, but that's, you know, the basic idea is that that, that kind of project, and actually, Aquasazini also applied very effectively for an energy efficiency grant too, so that it could be used for both energy efficiency projects on homes and um, solar on homes, both of which can dramatically lower the cost for the tenant. So the next grant I want to talk about, and I'm trying to move along a little quicker so we can get to lunch, is uh, um, the DOE EERE uh, grant uh, for tribes. Uh, and uh, that was, the reason it was around for it, you know, so it was due in towards, uh, I guess, early February. And um, it's, that grant is generally repeated. It's not quite as, exactly the same as the ICBG. ICBG tends to vary just slightly year to year. This one may vary more in terms of some of the categories for it, but this, is, this is reflects what the, late, the latest version was, which was relatively similar to the prior last two or so. Um, it allows for the installation of funds for energy efficiency projects. Um, it also allows for um, en energy efficiency combined with um, renewables too. There's actually two categories here. Or topic area one and the second one is um, a community scale energy project a uh, rural energy project typically which would serve a, a relatively high percentage of both the buildings and the energy use of a whole community so actually for instance Aquas housing applied for that to provide for solar for likely to be about 200 homes uh, on the on the reserve uh, reservation and so it um, it met that definition because it's serving so many homes on the reservation and, and a relatively high percentage of the overall energy needs of the reservation. Um, and this uh, grant, if you use topic area one, which is either energy efficiency or energy efficiency plus renewables for you know, just a few buildings, you can get $500,000. And if you do a community-wide project like Aquasasi did and like actually Mole Lake did as well, you can receive a million dollar grant. And you can actually then really put solar on a wide variety of buildings. Uh, for for, uh, for Mo Lake, that was on 18 different tribal buildings, as well as a few extra homes. And then they used the ICBG for an additional about 50 building, 50 homes. So it really can cover a lot. So, but it's different. You know, for um, going back into ICBG for a second, as you probably recall, there's a 25% leveraging um, scoring criteria essentially so you get your maximum of eight points for leveraging if you have 25 percent leveraging but it's not technically required here it is technically required that you have cost share you have federal cost non-federal cost share of at least 50 percent of the project cost which sometimes can be a real hurdle obviously doing a project what we'll talk about a little later on is that um, with the tax credit financing, we're able to, to structure projects where that whole 50% is covered by the investor and where the tribe or tribal housing receives uh, authority receives typically full credit for the 30% investment tax credit. So it's really like getting 80% in grants, 20% you pay off over time. And if we can pay it off relatively quickly, typically without interest. So it's like a, it's like a zero interest loan on a project. So that's the DUE. So DUE is I think, very valuable as well. Uh, it, you know, if you have a purpose for you, if you have a use already set up for your ICDBG, you might want to think about DUE in the future because typically there's there's no other purpose for it but energy. I guess is the bottom line. Um, and then John, can I make one point? Yeah. Uh, the point of these slides is not to try to get you to master all these different programs. The the larger point is just there are three main components to the strategy. They are grants, uh, uh, investment tax credits, 
and then um, leveraging the consumption. In other words, the power purchase agreement. So that those are the three components. And so we're going through a number of different grants. And the point is that you will choose a grant based on what's the best, you know, how you score, what the round is for the application, and what's best suited to your project. But just think of it in those terms, that the grant, there are enough of them out there that the grant is gonna be one of the pillars of the strategy. Uh, but I just didn't want you to get lost in the weeds about, oh my God, we have to learn all these, we have to do all these grants to be one of them. You don't have to do all of them. It's a mix and match kind of thing. Thanks, Brian. And then um, we heard obviously about USDA. USDA has the REAP program, the Rural Energy for America program, which can be very valuable as well. And uh, I'll hit on some of the highlights of these slides. Um, basically, it can be used for either energy efficiency or renewable energy. Um, and it can be significant. It, for a renewable energy, it can to $500,000. If you do a large scale solar project that serves a lot of, a lot of homes or tribal buildings or housing authority buildings, you can make it you know, very valuable to the tribe or tribal housing authority. They also have uh, competitive loan guarantees I'll, I'll briefly touch on too. Uh, and uh, so they can be used for a wide variety of renewable energy systems. We've been talking about mostly solar, and that's, that's covered on, on this slide uh, right here. So it's included that way. Wind is covered as well, but so almost any energy project you do would be covered by this, any renewable energy project. And uh, a couple of other key points. I guess in my mind, to make it worthwhile, you'd be going for a bigger project. You know, so it's worth all the effort of doing this stuff. Uh, if your project's more than $200,000, you need to have a technical report. But frankly, you're gonna want that anyways. And for solar, that's relatively easy now because what they do is they can utilize what's called either PV watts or helioscope. Those are two um, modeling technologies where you can put in actually the location of the building and how the solar rays are facing and their angle, and it will automatically spit out all the information about the production of the facility and how it will work. So it's, it's not, it's become not rocket science now. So it's just great. Actually, which I think is fantastic because a lot of these projects for tribes have historically have been a lot of feasibility work and no actual implementation. With these projects, it's you know, still a fair amount of work, but we can get implemented, and sometimes within the year, they implemented it and fully, fully, fully functional. Um, so, if you're doing energy efficiency, you need an audit as well, which uh, is not, which is understandable. Make sure you're doing the right energy efficiency uh, projects. Um, the grants, if the grant, you go for the grant, you can get up 25% of the project cost. <coughs> so it's, you know, in, in order, you know, you got the ICBG is the highest percentage scored by the grant, then the DOE, then this one. But it still can be very valuable, especially in light of the fact that solar's gotten so much cheaper now, too. So the combination of a decent sized grant perhaps on the federal side, perhaps with the states, some, some state incentives, and with the investment tax credits can really pay for a lot of these projects. Jeremy probably should look yep. grants. Yep, yep, we're, we're pretty far. So we're gonna go on. So that's the max amount of the grant you can get under that. So those, and we already talked about the federal home loan bank, so we're gonna skip through that, but that potentially could also be used on energy projects as well for these, for housing units. And then, and the HASDA can provide, you know, through the loan guarantee program, money for projects as well. That's what this slide is there, but um, the Title VI program. And then I just wanted to point out this slide because it's in your materials. There's this desire website. <coughs> which you click on it, you put in your state that you're located in, it'll show the various incentives that are available in your state for energy projects. I think it's very important also just, just to be aware of that in terms of not only solar, but energy efficiency stuff too for your tribal members' homes. So you can make sure they, they can get all available incentives uh, for energy efficiency projects to get bring down the cost of, of operating these homes. And then another slide, thanks <laughs> for the picture. Now I'm gonna talk about renewable energy tax credits for a little bit, just to make sure we're on the same page on that too. So this is that kind of second pillar that Brian was talking about, you know, getting federal and state and utility incentives and then, and then combining them with, with the tax credits. And bottom line is, you know, I think the reason why tax credits are around, and this is my basic view of it, is that, you know, typically Democrats want renewable energy, they want low-income housing to be built, and Republicans, this is all just a very general, appreciate tax, tax incentives, tax reductions. So they kind of come together in these areas for both these kinds of projects. Uh, have tax credits around, so they've been they they've been around for a while. It's the way a lot of projects are now funded. So 
the key thing is just learning how they work and how they can work for someone like a, a tribal housing authority or a tribe that doesn't pay taxes. So the question is, how do you make that work? And um, so the slide's about, you don't pay taxes, so you need to have someone who does pay taxes involved in your project, basically, and, and who has the right kind of tax appetite for these kinds of things. And the structure for both low-income housing tax credit projects and solar projects at its base level is essentially the same, that you have you need to have a partner that can be involved in, in the ownership of a, typically an LLC, a limited liability company, that can own the <coughs> asset and has a tribal affiliate, at least for the period of the tax, we call the tax uh, recapture period, or the tax incentive recapture period. So they're around, and for solar, it's only five years, which is good. So they have to just be around in the project for those, those five years. But it's also a lot simpler than local housing tax credits because there's not much to it. You, the big thing that, that the the treasury looks for on these projects is that the solar facility is up and running and it stays running. And so, um, again, tax credits in solar are 35 or 30 percent of the cost of the system. And the big, the big news I think that's valuable is that you're able to get that full value typically to the tribe. You know, with low housing tax credits, because they're spread out over time, you don't really get the full value of the tax credits necessarily. And it's also because of the fact that depreciation is a lot more valuable here. So as you're working on a project now, we'll make it the tax credits plus some of the depreciation value. So that's it's very valuable. Um, and uh, so again, the, the ITC, or the, the investment tax credit for solar, is available for both wind and wind and solar right now. Um, and uh, the key thing is that it's like it's like it's the same thing as with low mounting tax credits. That it provides capital to projects that you don't need to repay. So it's not a loan. You can actually get the value out of it that's structured right. Um, sorry, I'm working on the slide. And then um, and then you, it allows you to bring in an investor that will typically pay for the rest of the cost of the project. Under all the different grants you've been talking about, they can bring in someone who will pay the remaining cost of the project, and then th their investments paid off through the power, the power purchase agreement for any amount that's not been covered by the grants of the tax credit. And so it's like the uh, loan policy tax credit um, situation, but it's a lot easier because you don't deal with the, you know, the state agency they have to apply for for the loan policy tax credits. Uh, they're not competitive at all, so you can as long as the project's built, you get them. Uh, you know, they get the tax credits come to the investor in the first year, so because of that, even it's a lower percentage, they get, they get more value out of it that way, and they can leave typically within five or six years, not 15 years like you have for. Um, and so this is a piece of cake, it's a lot easier. <laughs> and then uh, just briefly, um, you know, if you're going to make this work, there's a few key elements that have to occur. It's very similar, again, for any kind of housing project where you have a tax investor involved first. You need to have some kind of acts agreement that they're allowed to be on the land, because otherwise the IRS would say they don't really own it, but that they're not involved in the ownership of it. So um, BIA has you know leasing regulations that typically require BIA to prove what's going on. But there's a couple of points we made here. One is there's the Hearth Act, which I think folks are becoming more and more aware of. And I what Brian said about 30 tribes have done this so far. Now they've approved Hearth ordinances. Which basically allows you to set the, or your tribe to set the rules for leasing and be the regulator of that. So that can be done that way. But fortunately also because not every tribe wants to go through this to do this. You can also um, have use a permit. BIA allows for permits to not be approved by them as long as they truly are permits. So they have to be shorter time and basically not provide exclusive access. But for solar, you don't need to have exclusive access. It's on the roof. It's just to allow them to be there. It's not for them to control the whole roof and to exclude others. Or if you put it on the ground the same way. So you can address that issue uh, much more simply through a permit. And then um, here's an alert. Uh, this kind of <laughs> makes everybody's awake. And, and me, I'm awake. The, uh, the tax credits actually go, start to go away <coughs> over time. You know, they're set up. Uh, historically, what's happened is that they would end, and then Congress would re, re up them. What they did this time is that with the last extension, they had them phase out over time. So. In 2020, for solar, it goes down to 26 percent, and then in 2021, down to 22 percent, and then after that, 10 percent. 
So I think it's a, we're at a good time now for solar uh, because the, the tax credits, the maximum value, the prices come down a lot, and the ability to utilize other funding sources too is, 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 a, is generally available. We'll watch some of what happens there, but it's generally available as well. So it's a great time to really focus on this issue and to drive down your members and your costs because of it. And, and your, your environmental goals as well. So one more. Um, <laughs> No more animal. No more animal, yeah, exactly, thank you. And then um, <coughs> these are the other things that make it work. Um, you know, again, you have, uh, you'd have a, an operating agreement for the LLC, which is similar to the operating agreement you'd see for a low housing cash credit project, but a lot, but stripped of all the income requirements and things like that that are there that, that make that more scary. Uh, you wanna, if you're gonna put a lot of solar in, you wanna make sure you have a good design build agreement too for that, regardless of whether you're using you know, grants or tax credits or otherwise, you want to make sure if you're going to put, you know, a lot of these projects we're talking about are two or three or four million dollar projects um, that are funded by, you know, the tax credits and other things, but you want to make sure that you have all the, all the I's dotted and the T's crossed in terms of responsibility to make sure those the solar projects built the way you want to build. And then uh, there's also, you know, whenever you have federal grants, you want to make sure you've uh, the procurement issues, uh, especially you know the new Part uh, 200 regulations, so uh, making sure you're on top of that. Um, oh, then here again in the in the contracts, you also make sure that there's provisions to make sure that your members are trained and they're getting jobs. And then, um, uh, so and then also in the procurement process, one thing you might want to do is what we've done a lot of times is make sure that the developer is bringing in tax tax credit investment to make sure because it, you, the, what you get from the tax credit investor can vary too it's everything's negotiated so we want to make sure we're getting the best deal overall best install price and best net price after the tax credit is taken out. then Brian mentioned the power purchase agreement is the last kind of key agreement that which uh, you know basically allows for us to have a payback schedule if there's any money owed still to the investor if they because if we have a, let's say a DOE grant, we have 50% covered by DOE, we have 30% covered by the tax credits, we still have 20% to pay off. We can pay it off this way and also then use that to show the IRS we're complying with all your requirements. Um, and what we typically have happen is that that interim period when you're paying off the remainder is at or below your present rates. And then after that, it's free. The system goes to you and it's free. And then uh, also you need to have things that could allow you, the system has to connect to the grid typically, so you have an interconnection agreement for utility, and then you have a net meter agreement so you get the full retail credit. So there's a number of uh, agreements, but in the end it, it, it all works very well together. If we had more time, we'd get into battery technology and going off the grid, but that's another presentation. <laughs> yes. And one thing thing is that batteries are coming way down in price now, so people are thinking about incorporating, but they're, what we've been doing too is having the system set up so that you using the right kind of what's called inverter, so you can add in batteries later on because the price of that is, is coming down dramatically now, especially with that new Tesla plant where they're building oodles of batteries and the price is coming just like everything else. These other areas, as, as more is produced, it becomes cheaper. So um, here's some quick illustrations. This is very actually similar to the Aquasasi thing we, we uh, project we've, we've known it before. So you might have, and theirs actually has grown because of the price coming in better. But, uh, you know, let's say you have 600 kW of, of solar to power 150 homes, that'd be 4 kW per home, so meaning about half the energy needs of each home that way. Uh, and it could be, you know, whatever kind of home or resident situation. And let's say it's a $2 million project. This would kind of match up well to a DOE grant where you get a $2 million project, but you get a $1 million DOE grant. Um, that's what this mentions here, I guess. And then, um, so you, the tax investor would then pay for the rest of the project. And uh, they would, you know, the, the value of the tax credit is about $600,000. So that plus the million dollars covers 1.6 million of the $2 million project. There also could be state incentives available that would reduce that further. And then what we have happen is that uh, through the power purchase agreement, the remainder can be paid off typically within about a five or six year period of time, oftentimes with rates that are lower than your present pay. So you, there's no upfront money from the tribe or tribal housing authority, and it's all paid, paid off. 
Um, this is just, you know, if you're going to use the ICDBG, it's, again, it's a little better because of the fact there isn't this 50% uh, non-federal cost share, so you could have more of it paid for by the grant. Um, I'm sorry, this, this is the DOE still, but I already, I talked to that paid, paid on better amount. Sorry, ICDBG, the big thing there is a 25% leveraging and the potential to have an investor pay for that leveraging as opposed to using your own block grant money or other tribal funds or housing funds. And so what that allows for, though, is that with the value of the tax credits, having a system that's about 40% bigger than you otherwise would have and have that cost share paid for. And then again, always thinking about can we leverage it further with state incentives. And this is just an example of how that might work financially. We might really typically have a, a, low, a real low, let's say you're paying 12 cents for the energy now, having a low cost PPA because there's not much to pay off with anything. It's mostly just the ongoing operating costs of the system, which you face anyways. There's minor amount of operation and maintenance, and there's also insurance. This like you put insurance on your homes, um, and then some accounting costs, and then paying it back under a low cost PPA. So if you'd save money right away, and then you'd save money further as the investor leaves. Um, and I'm going to skip that so we can move on. One thing to note also, when you're thinking about this, think about energy efficiency as well. There are oftentimes, especially if your tenants are using traditional lighting, things like that, those can be very, very high return, low cost, high return projects. And there's oftentimes very good state incentives for those two to be aware of that. And so when you think about takeaways, the key thing is that although there's a little uncertainty with the present administration, as you'd say, there are very significant federal and state incentives to be focused on. There's also uh, the ability to leverage that with tax credit funding, which I think you know meets the goals of HUD and other agencies to leverage, as well as your goal to leverage, which is very, probably the most important goal. And that um, any remaining costs can be financed through the energy savings, typically. So it's a, it paid off relatively quickly in five or six years, typically, and then after that, open system outright uh, without any costs that way. And um, so, and you're looking at the thing about strategies, you know, I think the key thing is, you know, what makes sense for you and your housing entity um, and your tribe. Uh, typically those have been, you know, our, what we've worked on has been solar for individual residences or residences. Um, and then, you know, identify what's the appropriate federal and state incentives to go after. Uh, you know, uh, think about incorporating the tax credits and then, um, then go after the funding and the tax credit investor as well as the developer. And we've worked with folks that are you know, real good in that area, developers that have been good to work with, I think, and then also they either themselves have tax appetite or can bring in the investor. And then one last thing, I think one thing that's great about HUD, they have training opportunities. We, we're aware of this one just because we've been involved in somewhat, and we personally experienced it, it's been a great opportunity to, you know, they typically allow for you to request assistance. They do so in renewable energy financing as well, which allows you to, you know, make a request, it's a really relatively simple request, and then to get trained further one-on-one -on, -one on these kinds of things, and really think through the projects as they relate to your tribe or housing authority, so especially your housing authority, so you can make a project that really works for you. Brian, is there? We have two more slides. Oh, we do? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have one. Now we have one more slide. Oh, we just find a really important one, yes. Yes, there we go. <laughs> We told you it was simple. <laughs> are they also using uh, new market tax credits? Yes, those are available for energy projects, but you know those have an, an, a complexity in their own, and you have yeah. to apply for them. Uh -huh. What they're probably really valuable for, if you're going to do, uh -huh. I, I would think about it for a very large very energy large, project that's yeah. going to address your a pretty big tribe that's yeah. going to address all solar, the energy needs. Of, yeah, solar, maybe when to get to. Yeah. But I, I think it's, right. I think you want to be like a $10 million project. Yeah, yeah. yeah. bigger, larger project. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, John. Thank you, Brian.